Welcome back to another episode of Palisade Radio. This is your host, Colin Cattell. Back on the show with us, returning guest David Cates. He was also the speaker at our conference in Belize back in February, where we focused on the uranium bull market. And we wanted to get David back on the program today, as a lot of investors are wondering if we are indeed in a new leg up in the bull market. So, David, first of all, welcome back to the program. And I'll let you start off uh, with that first question. Where are we with the uranium space? Is this a bull market? Yeah, Colin, thanks very much for having me back on. Uh, the uranium market, I mean, has always been a volatile market. Uh, we're, we're, we're still on the right side of, of the bottom, in my mind, uh, in that we are clawing back to a regular place where we can have an actual uranium market that functions. So I do think that uh, you know you can argue that we are in a bull market. We, we saw some really, really strong volatility in the first part of the year that we were all talking about. We saw the uranium price rise from that uh, 13-year low from uh, the fall of 2016, and then rise basically to uh, you know 25, 26, 27 dollar range uh, in, a, in a relatively short horizon. No doubt, we've seen the price come off from there, uh, a few steps down, and, and we're back now in the 1950, 20 dollar range. Uh, but I don't think anyone expected that this would move in a straight line from from eighteen dollars to, you know, a fifty dollars spot price. Uh, we know the market's oversupplied, and uh, what we're saying is that even though it's oversupplied, the price is is too low uh, to be to be somewhat rational, and and it really does need to move up from here for the market to get back to a rational place. So uh, I think we're still seeing that. It looks like we've got some support just under the twenty dollar mark. Uh, and and I'm hopeful. I think that we'll that we'll see the price rise from here again. David, a pointed and tough question, one that you probably can't answer, but maybe more of a gut feeling. We're almost back to the multi-year low in the spot price of uranium. Do you sense that we're going to drop below that, or do you think that that support will hold? Yeah, tough question to ask. I mean, it's the the commodity is trading in uh, not based on anything. Uh, you know, backed by by fundamentals in terms of uh, price for production or anything like that. But I think the reality is we know that uh, the lowest cost mine uh, in the world operates on an all in basis uh, at you know to break even you know around twenty one twenty two dollars. So I think it's fair to say any price below twenty one twenty two dollars is totally irrational for the market. We can talk about secondary supplies all we want. Uh, but primary supplies make up the bulk of the supply side of the equation. So for the best mine or the lowest cost mine in the world to not be economic makes no sense. Uh, we, we couldn't build the, the lowest cost mine in the world uh, in today's spot market. So, so I, I, don't, I don't really lose sleep about whether the price is going to stay at uh, you know, $18 or $20. I think it's, it's fair to believe that that price uh, will not sustain itself. So could we could we have some trading activity that brings the spot price down to eighteen dollars again? Yeah, we could. But I, again, like in the fall, I don't see that being sustainable. I don't see twenty dollars being sustainable. And I think there's there's really a, a, a lot of good reasons to believe that uh, this price will bounce off of this level, even without having to buy into the the fundamental story that tells you you need fifty five, sixty five, seventy five dollar uranium. Uh, in in the long run for this market to make any sense. Trying to dissect the move that we had that started in November of last year, where you had the spot price go from 18 to 27, and now back to 19, is it as simple as the price went up and then more groups or producers dumped on the market and that's what's pushed it back down, or is it hard to even know what would have made the price movements? Yeah, it's not easy to, to dissect it. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of a lot of small moving parts that in, in what is still a pretty thin market can uh, individually weigh the market one way or another. I think it's fair to say that we saw an organic bounce uh, off the $18 low, leading up to an announcement by Kazamprom to uh, cut production by by 10. percent So I'm, I was really encouraged by what I'd call the organic bounce uh, because we didn't have a major catalyst or even news that that got us to that point before the Kazakh announcement. I think the Kazakh announcement 
definitely shook things up, uh, reiterating how irrational the price had gotten in that the lowest cost producer in the world was having to cut production uh, and also evolving in a way that showed that they were going to act uh, commercially going forward rather than acting uh, more like a state-run uh, business, that they were now focused on real economic drivers and realizing that they weren't making money uh, in the big picture selling at those levels. So I think that definitely had an impact um, more so than the organic growth, and that created a, a ton of volatility. Now, at that point, you have traders getting into the market saying, uh, okay, I'm going to act faster than the utilities, so I'm going to buy as it's going up, and then the utilities are going to maybe realize that this announcement from Kazadam Prom is a real deal, uh, and then they're going to start buying, and I'm going to sell it to them, and I will have just made money on this rise. I think there was definitely some of that going on, and that's probably why we saw such a quick rise in the price. Now, it may have gone too quick, possible, and this is just a you know theory, you, you could have seen the price rise too quickly where the utilities then said, okay, well, look, this is moving too fast. I'm going to wait and see. Well, sure enough, if they wait and see and they're not buying, then who is buying? We're in an oversupplied market, and you're going to see the traders take some of their material off the table and start selling. Well, if the utilities don't keep buying into that selling, then you're going to see the price retreat back down. So I think that's a reasonable way of thinking about what might have happened. Um, you know, stepping back, I mean, that makes life really difficult for, for me uh, because we're trying to run a uranium mining business. It makes life really difficult for the chemicals of the world uh, as well. But when we think about it as an investor, it's actually the sort of thing that, that should get people going because we, we proved how volatile this space can be. We proved that you know, the right kind of logic or any sort of adjustment in this space where people come to reason about what the price might actually be will lead to some significant volatility. And those equities uh, on the uranium uh, side, the, the mining company side, we saw them double. So you know, when we talk about being undervalued, we talk about being depressed because of how low the uranium price is. Uh, I think we proved that out, that uh, this space can move quite quickly as soon as there's any shift in sentiment and any shift in price. David, using Denison as an example, as you're the CEO, of course, uh, you guys bottomed, I think, around November 3rd on the Canadian market at a price of around 49 cents, had over a 100% move, and now you've come back as low as, I believe, 55, 56 cents. Uh, so almost all of the gains have been given up. And like you just said, it's almost a second chance for many investors uh, even astute investors that were jumping in at the beginning of that move, you know, maybe say in December, uh, things had already moved, but now the, the, a lot of the prices of these stocks are almost back to where they were. I know a couple juniors that have even managed to make new lows, so it should be a good time for investors to, to take a look and want to get invested. Colin, I 100% agree. I mean, it, it's rare that uh, you, you get sort of a mulligan on, on these types of investments. I know that in uh, November, when, when Denison was at uh, 49 cents, I was blacked out, uh, so I, I couldn't buy the stock. I, I got in and I bought the stock around 53 cents as soon as I wasn't blacked out. And, uh, you know, of course, when you see a 100% rise, you kick yourself saying that you wish you had backed up the truck. Well, you know, I guess in this case, if you had backed up the truck and you had sold after 100%, you'd have done all right. Uh, if not, you're still doing fine because you're trading generally above those levels. But if you if you weren't in it on that first rally, you do have to ask yourself right now if it's another one of those opportunities where you're saying not only do I can you acknowledge that the, the equity prices are really at rock bottom lows, so that's a low risk low risk lower risk proposition. But beyond that, you've seen what can happen when the price does rise. And so you, you do have a mulligan, but you really do have to challenge yourself now. Like at some point, you really should be thinking about taking positions in this uranium market because the prices are rock bottom and you really would miss potentially another run uh, like we saw in the first part of this year. So, I, you know, that, that's been part of the message is, uh, as we've marketed is that it's a bit of a do-over or a mulligan or second chance uh, on the market. I don't know when the spot price you know, bounces, 
uh, up from here. But I know that on balance, I'm comfortable to believe that uh, it goes up. And, and I think there's a good return available to investors in the near term just on the bounce in that spot price. The Kazit Prom announcement coincided with that first move up that started in November, and I can't say for sure that it caused the move up, but it certainly was good timing. Are you looking for any type of major events? Uh, Paladin is having serious issues with their mine, which is a decent-sized contributor of uranium. Uh, Japan's continuing to restart reactors, and then Kazakhstan uh, still could make a further cut. Is there anything else investors should be looking at? Well, I mean, I think you've named a couple of really good things to keep an eye on. Like, I, I think the Kazakhs are, are, pro- are probably going to meet, maybe even beat their their targets on, on cuts. I think the Kazakhs are also getting more sophisticated in terms of deploying their own trading arm or sales arm, which I think the market may not understand the full impact of that or potential impact around that. I mean, this is a company that's uh, or an operation in Kazakhstan where they've basically been selling as they produce. Uh, nobody else does that, right? Everyone has some degree of working inventory. And this is a significant impact if, if they're able to achieve that kind of commercial uh, sales arm. And if they're able to then also start trading, uh, they, they they may have a better, you know, may be able to sort of uh, stifle some of the impact some of the other traders have had on the market and might be even more responsible with their trading activity. So those are those are all big things. They might not come with news releases, uh, but I think they'll have a significant impact on the market. What, what I'm really encouraged by, though, is, is that while the Kazakh announcement was, was in the middle of that rally we had from November through to February, it wasn't actually the first part of it. Uh, I really do think we saw an organic bounce back before the Kazakh announcement. And uh, and that's that's what has me optimistic about it, is that we knew that we were up 30%, somewhere in that range. You know, I have to check the math. Uh, but we were up in that range before the Kazakhs came in with their news. It's the Kazakhs that put fuel on the fire and got things going. So I think that potential exists right now with the spot price and the sentiment having retreated as much as it has. It requires a bit of a bounce in the spot price and you'll you'll see these equities pick up again as people stop selling off and actually start again taking those positions. Always a challenge, right, for the investor to be uh, too early or or just in time uh, when a, when when a market is falling. But I think we're seeing some stability here, and and it could be setting up for a, a new base to go for up from. From an industry insider like yourself, I want to ask what the difference is today uh, compared to pre-November or the last time that we were about this cheap with the spot price. Are you feeling like things are the same where sentiment is so low? And how about the key players in the business, like institutional investors that you're talking to, or uh, big high net worth investors, some of which are investors in Denison and GoVX and other companies that you're involved in? What do you feel the sentiment is overall? Well, I think the sentiments definitely shifted to negative uh, from what was, um, you know, quite an excited positive in the first part of the year. But, but I do feel like that's very much in line with where we were uh, in in November. I think, you know, people knowing how, how how quickly things turned around has been the same negative. It was a positive in terms of driving the prices of things up earlier this year. It's now a negative in that people remember how low it was, uh, how how you know short a time ago. So I think people have quickly reverted back to the negativity that was there in in uh, November. And I think it's largely based on, on the spot price having retreated. So what's really changed uh, in the market? There's still an oversupply. Uh, nobody ever said the oversupply was, was going away. Uh, we just knew that the price was uh, outrageously low. Uh, so there's still an oversupply. I think you do have some utilities coming into the market, testing the market, um, which is a positive. We didn't really have utilities playing around in the market in the fall. Um, you know, I, I don't think there's been a whole lot that's changed. Japan is vectoring, I'd say, more on the positive side of things. We've got five reactors running in Japan now, uh, looking to maybe have seven by the end of the year. I mean, I, I'm not sure that the whole market is aware of that. I think a lot of the market thinks Japan is, is never coming back. So, you know, I, I, there's, there's a lot of twos and fro's uh, from from February to now, uh, but I, I think on balance it hasn't really changed that dramatically, 
except for the fact that the spot price has come off. Uh, so I, I think there's a reason to believe that you're going to see the spot price bounce in the next little bit. But, you know, it's, it is a bit of a coin flip which way it goes first before it does rise. All right. Well, final question for you before we let you go, David. As a CEO of Denison and Palisade being an investor, many of our listeners certainly investors, what's going on uh, internally with the company that you can disclose any big uh, big news that's just occurred or things that should be watched out for? Yeah, we've uh, we've had a really busy first part of the year. We raised uh, a bunch of money in uh, January, February, a uh, combination of equity deal and, and a non-dilutive uh, monetization transaction where we sold uh, our toll milling stream at McLean from the Cigar Lake mine. So we're, we're all cashed up. And I think, uh, you know, shareholders should, should rest assured to know that we are cashed up. So as we go through these kind of troughs in the markets, uh, it's definitely not going to affect the capital structure of the company. Uh, we're definitely not looking to raise new money at these lows. Um, but being cashed up, we, we do have a pretty ambitious program on, on, on the radar here for the rest of the year and into 2018. Uh, focus right now, of course, is, is at Wheeler River. We're on the last leg of, uh, of drilling at, at Wheeler and at uh, the Griffin deposit as we work towards a pre-feasibility. So the summer program here will probably be our last drilling activity ahead of an updated resource estimate. You'll see an updated resource estimate in all likelihood towards the end of the year. That's then going to feed itself into our pre-feasibility study, uh, which we're expecting in 2018. So drill results to follow this summer, realizing that you know we really still are adding pounds uh, and expanding the Griffin deposit, but at the same time, driving up that level of confidence, uh, which is important. We need to be at an indicated level to be able to run the PFS. So that's that's top of the list. A uh, little bit of um, you know infill and expansion activity at Griffin. Another thing to really watch out for is that we do have a couple of other projects that we're going to be working uh, this summer. Uh, one that I'll, I'll highlight is, is our newest property, property called uh, Hook Carter. This is a property located in the western part of the Athabasca Basin. It is on the Patterson Corridor. It is on trend with Patterson Lake, Arrow, and Spitfire, which are all, of course, really well-known discoveries in the west. We've got about 15 kilometers of strike on that corridor that we cover with this Hook Carter property. Uh, we're 80% on the property. ALX uranium is in at 20%. It's pretty much untested, but I don't think any of those are expected to have been in the right place. Uh, we're doing a bunch of geophysics on it right now, and uh, we're expecting to start drilling on the property. Reconnaissance drilling, uh, so you know we're not... Of course, uh, who knows what we'll come up with on the first pass, uh, but there is always that opportunity for a find right away. Uh, so we'll start drilling there uh, August and into September. So just just always something to watch out for. I think you know we've been marketing a, a bunch in the last little bit, and do have to remind investors sometimes that when they're holding Denison, you know they've got rock solid assets behind the company in the eastern Athabasca, where you know we we know the infrastructure matters, and we've got a development project in Wheeler River looking to be the next project developed uh, in the Athabasca and in Canada. But beyond that, you really do get a ton of free optionality on some really great ground that we've accumulated 370,000 hectares and we've got the ability to raise the money to be able to put a small drill program together at a hook carter and so that's you know in all likelihood most investors are not paying for that when they're buying the stock but there's huge potential on that if we come up with anything like a PLS or an arrow then obviously it's going to generate massive value for our shareholders so always have to stay tuned in terms of our drill activity on on even those pipeline projects not just uh, Wheeler River. On that note, David, thank you for coming back on the show and sharing an update on the uranium market with us. Hopefully, uh, for investors that are in the space, we can start to get uh, another lift or a second leg up here in the market. And uh, we'll get you back on the program, hopefully in the next couple months, to get another update. All right, Colin, sounds great. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bid. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?